I'm Peter Block at ACC 20 and also the World Congress of Cardiology. This is a virtual Congress this year, uh, but this is the wrap up of day number one. And I'm with Deepak Bhatt from the Brigham and Wins Hospital in Boston. Deepak is an old friend and we've done these in the past. So welcome Deepak. Great to be here with you, or I should say, great to be here with you virtually speaking. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so we have uh, these four trials we need to speak about for Saturday. The first one being the Victoria trial. This is the Varisiguat trial in heart failure with uh, low ejection fraction patients. Uh, an interesting trial, perhaps not a world shaker, but nonetheless positive. So you want to pick that one up, Deepak? Sure, it's a novel mechanism of action, an SGC stimulator, and that is exciting because potentially there is a whole new way of treating heart failure. A press release had already come out saying the trial was positive, but now we know the results. So the primary endpoint in this population of patients with reduced heart failure was cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, and that was significantly reduced with a hazard ratio of 0.9, so a 10% relative risk reduction. Uh, it was about a 2% absolute risk reduction, really driven by hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, there was no significant effect on cardiovascular death or on all-cause mortality. Directionally, CV death was uh, numerically lower, but not statistically significant. So uh, another medicine that seems like it can reduce heart failure hospitalizations. Uh, it's a modest effect, but uh, statistically significant. Uh, reasonably safe overall, I would say. There was numerically a bit more syncope and hypotension, but in terms of things like electrolytes being out of whack and so forth, uh, nothing seemed too concerning. Uh, one thing that wasn't entirely evident to me, at least from the, the data that I've seen, is exactly what the background therapy was in terms of things like the latest medicines, uh, you know, Tachybutrol, for example, uh, Valtartan, what was the use of that, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, now we know in those with diabetes and even those without diabetes with heart failure, those appear to be useful medicine. So, you know, the, the real question will be, you know, what's the incremental value over other established therapies? But from a bottom line perspective, something new and uh, potentially can really add to our armamentarium of heart failure drugs. Exactly. And I, I, as I looked at this trial, I thought to myself, you know, how much is this really going to change what we do? Because we have pretty good therapy right now for heart failure, we're doing much better than we did, for example, 15 years ago. Nonetheless, it's a positive trial and worthwhile looking at in case maybe you need something else. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way I'd look at it. Okay, so let's move on to Voyager PAD, PAD being peripheral arterial disease. Voyager PAD is an interesting trial, Deepak, you know it as well as I do, rivaroxaban uh, for the prevention of bad thing outcomes uh, for either surgery or transcatheter revascularization in the lower extremity. Uh, it's a positive trial, it's rivaroxaban. And uh, just sort of as a sidebar, we're going to hear a lot about rivaroxaban uh, in this whole meeting. Rivaroxaban uh, is going to be highlighted in another trial tomorrow, the Protomos trial, uh, and we'll get to that tomorrow. But nonetheless, keep your eye on rivaroxaban. Uh, it was initially there for hip surgery, it, it turned out to be positive. And now we have this lower extremity <clears throat> transcatheter revascularization or surgery. Again, a positive trial, 9.9% uh, versus 7.3% for bad outcomes, uh, mostly driven by uh, amputation and so forth, but uh, for ischemia, I'm sorry, recurrent ischemia, but nonetheless, uh, a positive trial and something that is, again, perhaps not earth shaking, but if you're going to do a revascularization procedure on the lower limb, we don't have a lot of things that we know work pretty well. Um, yeah, I think that's the key point. So, so you're right in terms of uh, quote unquote heart events as isolated endpoints, those weren't significantly reduced. You know, things like MI, stroke, amputation were, were numerically lower, but not statistically significantly lower. Right. So what was driving it, of course, was uh, acute limb ischemia, urgent revascularization procedures, that sort of thing. But that's important. I mean, the whole reason you're doing a lower extremity revascularization is to prevent those sorts of outcomes. So I think the trial proved that rivaroxaban at this low dose uh, was able to do what the investigators were hoping it would do. So I think it's another tool in our toolkit in vascular medicine and PAD management, where we don't have a ton of things that are 
really effective. I mean, there's lipid lowering and that sort of thing, but, but beyond that, uh, not too, too much. Uh, of course, clopidogrel uh, had been uh, shown to be beneficial in a prior era. And here about half the patients or so were getting clopidogrel in both arms. Um, uh, so I guess one question people might ask is, you know, how did those patients specifically fare? Uh, that information uh, might be in the accompanying paper, but I at least didn't see it in the presentation. And, um, you know, myself, I've been using aspirin and clopidogrel post uh, lower extremity revascularization for years. But the reality is that's not evidence-based. That's extrapolating from the coronary literature. So now the investigators have done uh, something that creates actual randomized evidence. So I think this does now create a role for this rubroxaban 2.5 BID. And it does build upon results of other trials like COMPASS. Exactly. But the other interesting thing about this is a lot of people will be put on clopidogrel anyway for just because people do that and poss possibly even aspirin or both. And then we have the issue of if you add rivaroxaban to that, will they bleed more? And I think we don't know that from the presentation, but it's an interesting issue about how this will go forward. Nonetheless, a positive trial and at last randomized uh, data that we can look to. Absolutely. And as far as bad bleeding, you know, at least uh, in carefully selected patients, obviously at low risk of bleeding, no significant excess in fatal or intracranial bleeding. Timmy major bleeding trended to being higher, as you'd expect when you're stacking therapies, but still it seemed safe to add rivaroxaban at this dose to the mix. Yeah, I think it's fair to say if you give an anticoagulant, patients will bleed. Right. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Compass. Uh, yes, compass diabetes. So the overall compass trial has been presented, of course, that's high ischemic risk, but stable CAD and or PAD overall trials positives, significantly lower CV mortality, all cause mortality also lower. And what is being presented here uh, by me actually is compass diabetes. And what we've done in this analysis is take that subgroup of patients from the overall compass trial, that was 27,000 patients in the overall trial, and, and look at those with diabetes and compare the results of aspirin plus the same vascular dose of rivaroxaban, 2.5 BID, uh, versus aspirin plus placebo. And the bottom line was, as in the overall trial, uh, the diabetes subgroup was also very positive a significant reduction in overall ischemic events, uh, whether you're looking at the composite of cardiovascular death, MI stroke, or lumping in uh, major adverse limb events, including amputation in there, in either case, significant reduction. But I think what was most interesting was that uh, mortality was reduced in the overall trial, as you recall, and there were consistent benefits in mortality reduction in both those with and without diabetes and compass. But in terms of absolute risk reductions, numerically speaking, there was a threefold higher reduction in all-cause mortality in those with diabetes versus without diabetes you know, who are uh, receiving aspirin plus this uh, low dose of rivaroxaban. So I think that shows us that, yes, uh, the overall compass trial was positive, uh, but there are some subgroups such as those with diabetes or as previously shown polyvascular disease that seem to benefit particularly in terms of absolute risk reductions that are large. So I'm going to ask you two questions, Deepak, since you presented this. Number one, somebody once told me if you need 27,000 patients to prove your point, it probably isn't a big deal. Uh, how would you respond to that? You know, it's a good question. Uh, people that aren't trialists often uh, do raise that, and, and there's some legitimacy to it, but not a lot of legitimacy to it. So you know, I think uh, first we have to start as physicians with a little bit of humility. And if we look overall in medicine, there's relatively few things we do that are objectively improving hard outcomes, especially things like mortality, virtually nothing we're doing. Uh, and same in cardiology. I mean, there are sure things like lytic versus no lytic, primary PCI versus lytic. Yeah, there are things that reduce mortality, uh, maybe an end STEMI, a high risk, uh, there's a reduction in mortality plus MI as a composite, but relatively few things are influencing endpoints. Now, Encompass patients were on great background therapy. So everybody's on aspirin. Most of these folks were on ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, other good generic stuff. So to show an incremental benefit there uh, isn't so easy. So I think for physicians on the front lines that are trying to improve outcomes of patients, um, you know, the outcome reductions are often in absolute terms relatively modest in size. But here in Encompass, we've identified a subgroup where it wasn't so modest. 
Yeah, I would agree. I, I just wanted to gig you a little bit, because, but I think that this is an important trial. So how are you using a river band now in your diabetic patients? How do you actually do this? Sure. So to be clear, again, everyone in Compass had either CAD or PAD or both, and now we're overlaying diabetes versus no diabetes. So uh, just to be clear, this isn't diabetes primary prevention, but, um, but in this high-risk secondary prevention, I would look at patients who have diabetes. I would also do these uh, for folks that don't have diabetes that have CAD or PAD and see, look, are they maxed out on their statin and LDL reduction? If their triglycerides are high, are they on icosapentethyl? Uh, if their glucose is out of whack, are they on an SGLT2 inhibitor and or a GLP-1 agonist? And uh, if their blood pressure is too high, is that controlled? And you know, once all these risk factors between lifestyle modification and meds are controlled, if they're still at high vascular risk, I think there is the time to consider uh, adding this vascular dose of rivaloxaban. And in the PAD world and the vascular medicine community, I think we've embraced these data. I think cardiologists that aren't in vascular medicine perhaps haven't really embraced the COMPASS data to the extent the data actually support. You know, once again, we're talking about, you know, if once your patient has been treated and you're still not getting the kind of answers that you want from their numbers, uh, this is a good addition. It might, in fact, help them. And if mortality is decreased, you've made a big jump. I think this is a good thing. Yeah, I agree. And just the only caveat, of course, this strategy only applies to patients that are low bleeding risk. If patients are at high bleeding risk, you know, obviously being added, uh, even this low dose of Roxman is going to increase major bleeding. It did in our analysis. Uh, it's a hazard ratio of about 1.7, so about a 70% excess in major bleeding. So that's not trivial, but fortunately, no significant excess in fatal or intracranial bleeding. So half the select patients, they're at low baseline bleeding risk. So in, in someone that's bled before, on antithrombotic therapy or on aspirin alone, I wouldn't add it. But in patients that don't have a history of bleeding and it seem like, you know, sort of good substrate, uh, there I would consider it. There you go. Like I said before, you give it any any coagulant, patients will bleed. That's okay. Right. So let's move to the last one for today. That's Taylor PCI, <clears throat> a fascinating trial, actually, clopidogrel genotyping. Now, that's been around for Lordy. 10 to 15 years, and we still don't know whether it is or is not a good thing to do. And now, finally, we have a uh, trial that shows that clopidogrel genotyping has a risk ratio uh, out for outcomes of 0.66. That's not too bad. Uh, its uh, p-value does not come out to less than 0.05, but nonetheless, it looks like when one looks at the hard data on the presentation, that there must be something in this trial that tells us that maybe genotyping would be helpful, particularly in the early days after an intervention or whatever. So uh, uh, this is an interesting trial. Do I think it's going to be earth-shakingly different for what we do for genotyping versus not? My guess is that people who use genotyping uh, for those trying to find those people who are rare, who truly are resistant, uh, might be a useful thing. And they'll say, this is great. I'm going to continue. I'm not so sure that for the general cardiology uh, physician, this is going to be um, enough of a changer to make them change their minds about using genotyping. It's not inexpensive. Uh, but nonetheless, it looks like the data are there to support it, uh, but not overwhelmingly. What's your take on this? Sure. So uh, I, I think that was a good summary. I mean, I, I'm the chairman of the Data Safety Monitoring Board, so I, I might have a view that is a little bit rosier than yours. I, I, I thought the investigators did a great job. The NIH did a great job funding this and uh, stepped up to the plate to answer a question. Like you said, it's been around forever with data that haven't been clear. And, uh, you know, yeah, there have been some studies that show maybe clopidogrel genotyping is useful, but it hasn't changed practice. Virtually no one is doing it. A few folks are doing it. So, you know, this study was necessary to try to nail down whether we really should be doing it as a matter of routine practice. And I, I think there'll be a lot of discussion around statistics with this trial. As you pointed out, the p-value was 0.056 with a hazard ratio of 0.66. So, you know, personally, I think there's something there, but, um, you know, hardcore uh, statistics type folks will say, well, the p-value isn't positive. But, you know, as you mentioned in a post hoc analysis, when the investigators looked at the first few months after randomization, you know, there was a very significant p-value in favor of clopidogrel genotyping. 
uh, with a hazard ratio of like 0.21 or something. So, you know, I, I personally think there's something here. I, I think this is the first meaningful step in cardiology towards showing potential value of genotyping. And I think this will be the first of many trials to come, not necessarily for clopidogrel genotyping per se, uh, but just for this concept of personalized medicine. Exactly. I think this is a step forward for that personalization. And we're going to be hearing so much more about personalization and drug therapies going forward in any case. So maybe this is a baby step, a first step. That's not a bad thing. And we'll be hearing a lot more about genotyping in the future. So that'll wrap it up for the Saturday. Uh, Deepak, I'm delighted that you could spend the time with me. Really appreciate your being here. Yes, always great to speak with you, Peter. Thank you.